Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. I do want to encourage you to check out my wife's business uh, through Lila Rose at Lila Rose, L-I-L-L-A Rose dot biz slash Ashira. They have a wide variety of different styles and designs uh, to fit a wide variety of different tastes. In addition, they have some select styles uh, for the 4th of July that uh, may be of interest. I encourage you to go and check that out at Lila Rose, L-I-L-L-A Rose dot biz slash Ashira. Well, now it's time for today's episode of the Airmail Mystery. We're bringing you episodes three and four. Let's go ahead and take a listen. Ladies and gentlemen, here is a mystery that will tax your powers of deduction. A mystery surrounded with all the thrill, the romance, and glamour of flying the airmail. Imagine yourself in the role of Irene Delroy, clever girl operative of the Department of Justice, detailed to discover who is responsible for the deliberate wrecking of Trans-American Airlines' fastest airmail ships and the subsequent robbing of each plane after the crash. Andy Andrews, pilot of the ill-fated 601, the last ship to crash, has been questioned by Miss Delroy without revealing any important information. Ernest Powers, general manager of the company, has called the board of directors to witness the investigation. Jimmy Gifford, roving newspaper reporter, an old friend of Miss Delroy, whose keen nose for news has sent him to Trans-American Airlines, is also present at the meeting. Mr. Powers' secretary has just opened the door with an important bit of information. Pardon me, Mr. Powers. We just got a call from the ranger station on Twin Peaks. Yes? They've located 601. What? What? They've located 601, sir, in Devil's Canyon. Uh, Good. Now we'll be able to find out whether the bond shipment is missing or not. We'll get the mail out of the wreckage and shoot it ahead on the next eastbound. I don't think you'll be able to do that, sir. Why not? Because the ranger station reported Mr. Fitzgerald found the ship and it said it was completely burned to pieces. Uh. (laughs) Well, there you are, gentlemen. Get that ranger station on the phone for me in a hurry, Maisie. Yes, sir. So Fitzgerald found the ship, huh? Listen, Miss Delroy, if any part of that shipment is missing, that fellow has something to do with it. And just who is this Fitzgerald? The man I fired not over an hour ago. The mechanic who serviced Andrew's ship before it took off tonight. You say you let him go? Yes, not more than an hour ago. May I ask for what reason? For what reason? Listen, it was Fitzgerald's job to see that 601 took the air in top shape. He failed in that responsibility. I let him go. That's all. We're not going to put up with inefficiency around here. We've lost $80,000 worth of airplanes in less than a month. We're going to have efficiency around here if I have to fire every man in the organization. Bravo! Bravo, Powers! Bravo! That'll be enough out of you, Gifford. 
As a representative of the press, we've allowed you to remain. One more break out of you, and I'll have you thrown out. So you fired Fitzgerald, eh? Yes. What about it? <laughs> Nothing. Only you fired Miss Delroy's aide de camp, so to speak. <laughs> That's good. What do you mean? Fitzgerald evidently has been assigned to work with Miss Delroy in unraveling this case. Right, Irene? Well, there's no harm in admitting it now. How did you find that out, Jimmy Gifford? Ah, the press moves quicker than the eye. I just sort of put two and two together. Our Washington correspondent wired me that you and Fitz headed south together. I found you, so I figured that Fitz must be somewhere around. You mean that grease ball was... A Department of Justice officer working undercover. Miss Delroy, why wasn't I... Uh, that is, uh, why wasn't this company notified of that fact? Oh, we saw fit to keep it undercover at the time, Mr. Powers. You would have been notified in due time. Hmm. So the Department of Justice is going about putting their men in important positions with this company, hmm? That's just about the... Hello? Oh, it's the ranger station. Hello? This is Powers, Trans-American Airlines. The operator tells me that one of our men found our ship in Devil's Canyon. Yes. Is Fitzgerald there? Gone back to the wreckage, huh? Now listen, we're leaving Metropolitan Airport by car in just a few minutes. Don't let anyone in or out of the canyon road. Fitzgerald has gone back to watch the wreckage, Mr. Elroy. I suppose we'd better get started. As you say, Mr. Powers. Uh, but before we go, there's something I want to get straight with Andrews here. Yes, I believe we've been interrupted. Now, listen, Andrews. I'm not saying that you had anything to do with the loss of these ships, however strange it might seem that you were the pilot in charge of each one. But I do say, if you know anything of importance, you'd better spill it right now. I've told you all I know, Powers. The motor was turning up okay when I took off from Metro here. Just 30 minutes out over Devil's Canyon, it cut on me clean as a whistle. You know that country out there as well as I do. I'd have been a fool to stay with the ship over that country. The weather was bad, and I didn't have any too much altitude anyway. So I dumped the tanks, cut the switches, and bailed out on my chute. Just a minute, Mr. Andrews. You say you dumped the gas tanks and cut your ignition switches before you jumped. Yes, ma'am. We always do that in the event of crash landings. It eliminates the fire hazard. Then how do you account for the fact that the ship has been found completely burned? I've been trying to decide that myself, Miss Delroy. You've a lot of things to worry about, Andrews. What do you mean by that, Powers? Suppose, suppose the dump valve stuck. You know those dump valves don't stick, Andrews. I'd say that you were in this thing clear up to your neck. I know you've been hard up for money. I know lots of things that you don't think I know. Listen, Powers. I'll fly your ships for you. I'll fly them in rain, in snow, in good weather, or in bad weather. But I won't stand for any of your insulting inferences. If I'll you gentlemen you... will refrain from starting a row over a personal matter, we will try to map out an orderly procedure. May I ask a question, Irene? You care to, Jimmy? Doesn't it seem strange to you, Andrews, that all three crashes took place at the same spot on your eastbound route? Sure, but that's no reason why power Ah, has... and don't you think it's strange that the motor should cut out without any warning? What do you mean by that, Gifford? The motor just doesn't quit, Powers. There's bound to be a reason. I don't see what you're getting at. Just calling your attention to the fact that the motor did not stop from the usual causes. Other than that, I have nothing to say. Andrews, do you figure the ship would glide far after you left it? Not far. Not over a mile or so. I didn't have much altitude. You landed on the rim of the canyon in your chute, did you not? Yes, ma'am. Well, do you figure the ship had sufficient velocity to carry it into the canyon where Fitzgerald reported finding it? Mm, yes, ma'am, it would. Thank you. Well, Mr. Powers, if you'll call your car, we'll start for the canyon. Coming, Jimmy? Certainly. I have a hunch that Fitzgerald is going to have something interesting to tell us. Oh, hello, Miss Delroy. <laughs> I just about given up hope of seeing you and was figured on going back into town. But I thought it best to stay with the wreck until you got here. You're exactly right, Chip. We don't want anything moved until we've had time for a thorough investigation. Where's the ship? Well, what's left of us just around this bend, ma'am. It's all burned up. Pretty bad crash. Mail pouches were all destroyed. All of which adds to our little mystery. Gifford! <laughs> I might have known it. A little early on this job, ain't you, newshound? I believe in getting in on the ground floor of things, Sergeant. Anybody been near the plane since you first found it? Not that I know of. Say, who'd you bring with you? Who's that getting out of the car? Why, you should know the uh, gentleman, Fitz. Powers, general manager of Trans-American. You know him, don't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he fired me last <laughs> night. <laughs> Guess he figured you weren't so hot as a grease monkey, Sergeant. How long had you been working before you got the gate? Well, not long. 
At least not long enough to find out anything. Hey, where'd Delroy go? Probably ahead to inspect the wreckage. Got any ideas on this case? No, not yet. But you mark my word, somebody's wrecking them ships. I know that motor on this ship tonight was okay for the takeoff. Where'd you learn anything about airplane motors, Fitz? Your last job was at the police department. Well, I learned a little about them during the war. That's why the chief put me on this job with Delroy. Hey, it's some job, too, take it from me. What do you know about this fellow Andrews? Well, the pilot? He's okay, as far as I know. But the rest of the ship's through on schedule. Got a good record, good flyer. Is there any way for Andrews to know when he's carrying securities or bonds? Well, he could have found out, I reckon. Wouldn't be hard to do. Hey, you don't think this guy maybe is... What do you think, Sergeant? Hmm. Well, it might bear watching at that. You know, it wouldn't be at all difficult to report trouble over the plane radio, cut the switches, and bail out in a parachute. Yeah, but what good would that do him? He couldn't bring those bonds down with him. You don't think he'd try to pull a job like this without help, do you? Look, couldn't he cut the switch just before he gets to the canyon here, bail out, and have his accomplice loot the ship after it crashes? Say, maybe that's what he did do. Uh, and the guy that was helping him set fire to the wreck so we couldn't tell if the bonds were missing or not, huh? How about those other crashes, Fitz? Well, I didn't investigate them. But Delroy tells me that the mail sacks were cut open and the money shipment was stolen. No fire? No, not on the other two. Hey, I'm going to talk to Delroy about this guy, Andrews. There's bound to be something phony about his story. Let's climb on down to the crash and see what Delroy and Powers are talking about. Yeah, uh, uh, easy here. Okay, I'll those it. loose rocks. Say, wait a minute. Huh? The idea just occurred to me, Fitz, that we may be all wrong about the way those ships are robbed. What do you mean? There's only one road leading into the canyon. The forest ranger back there on the hill assured me that no one except yourself had been down this road in the last three days. Yeah, there's something in that, too. Just the same, I'm keeping my eye on that Andrews guy. All right, Sergeant, you may be on the right track. Oh, here we are. Anything interesting, Irene? There's one thing for certain, Jimmy. This ship was set on fire deliberately after the crash. No, Miss Delroy, I wouldn't say anything like that without evidence. Perhaps, as Andrew suggested, the dump valve stuck and the gasoline sprayed over the motor and caught fire. I've looked into that, Mr. Powers. Both dump valves are open. There's every evidence that this ship was burned quite a while after the crash. But why? What could be the objective? Well, whoever is responsible for the wrecking and robbing of this ship wanted to destroy all evidence of its robbery. Hey, that's just what Gifford was telling me, ma'am. <laughs> Jimmy's powers of deduction seem to be working as usual. There's one thing that doesn't ring true, Irene. What's that? Well, it took a lot of gasoline or oil to make this fire. The only way the crooks could transport it down here would be by automobile. And the forest ranger back on the road said that no car had been down here in the past three days. We can't let some minor detail shadow the true facts in this case, Jimmy. This ship was deliberately set on fire. How and why remains to be seen. Oh, I think you're inclined to attach too much mystery to this crash, Miss Delroy. I, for one, believe that you'll find the bonds destroyed in that pile of ashes. Hey, hey, look at this, Miss Delroy. What is it, Sergeant? A pocket knife, ma'am, with the blade open. Let's see it. Mmm, nice and sharp. Just the thing to use for cutting mail pouches. Where did you find it, Fitz? Uh, right over there, ma'am, behind those rocks. Here's a pair of goggles, too. A pair of what? Flying goggles. Look. Here, Sergeant. Hmm. Mr. Powers, your pilots don't wear goggles flying these fast nails, do they? No, the cockpits are entirely closed. There's no necessity to wear goggles. Well, someone visited this crash last night before the sergeant found it and left these flying glasses in this pocket nut. What's the matter, Paul? Uh, oh, nothing. Nothing at all. I, I was just trying to... Hold uh... something back? No, no, no. You're wrong. I... I was merely... Did you ever see this knife before? No. Did you ever see these flying goggles before, Mr. Powers? I want the truth now. No. That is, uh, well... You're keeping something back. No, no. I I just didn't want to... Uh... You know who these goggles belong to, don't you? Yes. I've seen them before many times. This is a serious matter, Powers. Who owns these goggles? Those goggles belong to the pilot who bailed out of this ship just before it crashed. Andrews! <laughs> No one in the office. Wonder where Roberts is. Who is Roberts, Mr. Powers? Our radio operator. He's usually at the control panel. Maybe he's in my office here. Come on in. <laughs> hey, Scott. Please. Shut the door, quick. It's gas. Stand back, Irene. There's a man 
man lying on the floor in that room. We can't leave him in there. <coughs> Let me in there. I'll get him out. Give me your coat, Gifford. Here. <laughs> Let her be careful, Fitz. I'll get him out. Open all the windows around the place. I think it's tear gas. We can't be sure. And there's a ventilating system in the hall. I'll turn it on. Good. That'll clear the gas out of the room. How's the sergeant coming along, Jimmy? <clears throat> He's got the fellow all right. He'll drag him out if the gas doesn't get him. <coughs> He's got him all right. Here he comes. Uh, your gas, all right. <coughs> Pretty heavy layer. <coughs> uh, I hope this poor devil hasn't had too much. Oh, a handkerchief, Gibbert. Here you go, Sergeant. Anybody know this fellow? Yeah, he's a night radio <coughs> operator, Roberts. He must have been the only one around. <coughs> the dispatcher's probably outside loading the westbound. <coughs> Well, that gas is pretty bad. It's water. Okay. I'll start working on him. Loosen his collar, Miss Delroy, and try to get some fresh air stirred up around him. The ventilation system is working now, Sergeant. That's good, Power. Get some wet towels. Hurry. You know, I don't like the looks of this, Miss Delroy. What do you mean, Sid? This fellow Roberts ain't a nosy sort of a guy. <laughs> Don't go poking around in Powers' office for nothing when Powers is out. You mean there must have been a reason for him being in the office? That's the way it looks to me, ma'am. Robert saw, either saw something or heard something that made him go into that room. It takes something pretty important to get him away from his radio panel out here. Here's your water, Irene. How's he coming along, Fitz? Uh, don't know yet. He, he ain't getting his breath very quick. You better get a doctor out here right away. Yeah, I'll call one from the waiting room for him. I wonder what Roberts was doing in the private office. That's what Fitz was trying to figure out. Where's the pilot, Andrew? I dropped him off at the big hangar before we came over here. He's taking the eastbound mail out at 11. Said he wanted to check up on the plane. You don't think he had a hand in this, do you? Oh, no, not this. This happened probably 15 minutes before we came back, and Andrew was along with us. Fitz, hmm? his eyelids were fluttering just now. Good. If we can just get some fresh air into his lungs, we may be able to get him out of it. Oh, here comes Powers. Ask him if there's any whiskey around here, will you? Not necessary, Sergeant. Glad to accommodate you. Oh. Here. Thanks. Uh, it's up his head. I uh, called for a doctor. How's he coming along, Miss Delroy? Looks as though he'll be all right, thanks to the sergeant here. What ship is that? Must be our westbound passenger taking off. Yes, that's it. Is Robert the only one in here at this time of night? It all depends. He's the only one on active duty. The dispatcher and field manager are outside with the ship. Do you know of any reason for Roberts to be in your private office? None whatever. I've never seen him in there before. Was your office locked? It's generally locked, yes. It was locked tonight. Well, does Roberts have a key? Not that I know of. Yeah, he's coming, too. Help me get him up in this chair here, will okay, you? Okay, uh, uh, There. Now, you fan him a bit, of me. How do you feel, huh? Oh. Okay, I guess. What was it? Gas. Tear gas, I think. How did it hit you? I, I couldn't breathe. It choked me. That's all I remember. Mm. Feel like talking? Yes, I I suppose so. Did you get him? We get who? The man that was in that room. Who was it? I don't know. Let's start I... at the beginning, Robert. How did you happen to go into Mr. Power's private office? Well, I heard something in there. So I thought I'd better go in and see who it was. What did you hear? Voices and noises? Well, it sounded like someone filing or sawing something. I see. How did you get in? By the door. Wasn't it locked? No, ma'am. I opened the door, and there was a man standing over at the steel filing cases working on them. The filing case? You better look to see what's missing if the gas has cleared out of your office enough, Mr. Powers. Yes, I'll do that at once. We have some very valuable papers in that case. Did you recognize the man, Robert? I, I'm trying to think. His face seemed familiar. That is, I, I'd seen it before somewhere. I want you to think hard. Was it anyone connected with the airport? Let me think. No, it wasn't any of the chaps around here. Well, go on with your story. What did you do when you saw him? Well, his back was to me, and I asked him what he was after. He whirled around, and something blinded me and choked me. That's all I remember. Mm -hmm. Do you know if he had the filing cabinet open yet when you discovered him? I don't remember. Well, I found out what the thief was after, Miss Delroy. What? The operation schedules. They're gone. The operation schedules? What could anyone want with them? They contain the departure and arrival times of all our ships in the Western Division, both mail and passenger. All connection schedules and route markings. All landing field data and radio schedules. 
Something very funny is going on around here. I've got it. I've got it. I know who the fellow was that I saw in your office. Who? I don't know his name, but I do know that he's the same man who was here earlier tonight and bought a seat on the westbound plane. The westbound? And the westbound just took off a few minutes ago. Quick, get over to the radio. Tell Chapman and the westbound to return to the field. We'll see who this man is. Hurry, uh, call 610 and tell him to get back here right away. We'll meet the ship. I'm sure it was the same man. I saw a scar. Don't over... talk, don't talk. Get 610, hurry. Metropolitan to Chapman in 610. Metro to Chapman in 610. Go ahead. 610 calling Metro. 610 calling Metro. Go ahead, Rob. Metro to 610. Powers orders you to return to the field right away. Go ahead. Metro to 610. Powers want you to return to the field right away. It's urgent. Go ahead. 610 to Metro. 610 to Metro. Our receiver is completely dead. We can't get your order. We will proceed to South Flat to get instructions. Sorry. Uh, they pulled a fast one on us. Whoever is on that ship put the receiving set out of order as soon as he saw the pilot working the field. That's what happened. He'll get away. Where did the pilot say he'd land? Salt Flats. It's about 90 miles. Do you have a radio station there? Yes, ma'am. That's it. Call Salt Flats. Tell them to hold the westbound plane until we get there. Okay, Miss Delroy? I think we'd be justified in doing just that. What a story. Boy, this is great. Metropolitan to Salt Flats. Metro calling Salt Flats. Go ahead. Salt Flats to Metro. Go ahead. Salt Flats. 610 is landing there in half an hour. Now, get this. Get a couple of men and hold the ship when it lands. There's a man aboard wanted by the Department of Justice. Don't let anyone out of the ship. Got it? Go ahead. All right. What do you think this is? April Fool's Day? I owe him. Go ahead. Oh, he thinks it's a joke, huh? Well, I'll tell him. Get the set on. Give me the mic. Salt Flats, this is Powers. Listen, you... You meet that ship when it gets down and hold everybody on board. If you don't, I'll fire every man at your field. That's all. I guess that'll hold him. Yes, sir, Mr. Powers. Hey, Mark, I just got a call. But... <laughs> Poor guy's so excited he almost forgot to cut his mic off. Now, he'll be more than excited if he doesn't hold that ship. Let's get going. Hello? Yeah? Who's that? Uh, phone from A Hangar, sir. Mm. What did you want? Uh, just a minute. It's Andrews. He's ready to leave with the eastbound mail. That guy sure got nerve. Three bad crashes and he's ready to start again. Andrews, huh? Do you want to let him go, Miss Delroy? He's under suspicion, you know. I think we can let him go for now. We'll be back tomorrow afternoon, won't he? At 4.40, yes. It'll be all right. But tell him I want to talk to him before he leaves. Hello, Andy. The chief says okay. Miss Delroy is coming over to the hangar to see you before you hop. Come along with me, Jimmy. I want just a word with Andrews before he starts his... All set, Andy. I fixed that booster switch. Good. We'll warm her up. Pull her through. That's enough. Okay. Contact. Contact. Sounds okay enough. Oh, here you are, Andrew. I'm glad I got here before you took off. I'm just warming her up, Miss Delroy. What did you want? Have you looked the ship over carefully? Yes, ma'am. I gave it special attention. <laughs> I'm flying, if you know. I don't mind telling you there's something very strange going on around here, Andrew. I don't want anything to happen to you, but I have a feeling Well, that... cheer up. There's nothing but mail aboard tonight. Nothing of value. Even so, I now feel Now, let I... me tell you something, little lady. When we were out in Devil's Canyon today, I took a good look at the terrain there. If I have any more trouble over that spot, I'm reasonably sure that with a little luck, I can set this old bus down on the floor of the canyon. Then we'll see who is doing what. Oh, there's my signal. You better step back so I won't dust you. Well, good luck and be careful. Watch out over Devil's Canyon. Okay. Well, Jimmy, I hope he makes it. He'll make it all right. Those crooks aren't after just plain mail. That's what worries me, Jimmy. What do you mean? We've kept it a secret, Jimmy. Not even Andrews knows it. 
But there's a $60,000 shipment aboard that plane. Welcome back. Well, in modern custom, uh, we would tend to look at the flask of uh, whiskey as a bit of a sign of a problem if you're, you know, got that handy all the time. But this was a pretty common thing, particularly in fiction back in the 1930s, and I guess you've got a medicinal justification. I, I always carry a flask of whiskey just for such an occasion. Overall, though, I really do enjoy uh, this entire series. And uh, as you listen to it, uh, particularly if you listen to some of the beginning ones, it's inviting you to uh, match wits with Irene Delroy. And so it's paced in a way where you can pick up all of the clothes. And you can really begin to get a scope of the problem. And with the idea that you've got 13 parts to work through the case, uh, you know, and of course, it's not going to take all 13 parts to get to a solution. We're going to have a few which are going to have some action coming up. But regardless, you've got a lot of time to examine uh, evidence to really get a feel for what's going on. And I do like the way that uh, Irene uh, questions the witnesses, and I also like the interplay between the characters. And the characters are likable. Uh, they're not, you know, certainly by modern standards, particularly well-developed, but you've got a feel for the type. And uh, you don't even have a sense that Fitz you know, is like the dumb sidekick, which would really be a thing where you would have, a, you know, in, you know, 1930s movies and even in some radio programs, uh, you would have a character who was along to be dumb and to be the comic relief. And really no one on the team uh, is that. Uh, certainly each uh you know, both, you know, Irene, Jimmy, and Fitz, they all bring their own talents and approach to the case, but you don't feel like this character is just totally useless, which is kind of refreshing. So I've been enjoying it. I hope that uh, you're enjoying it as well. Thank you so much to Jameson. Jameson has been one of our Patreon supporters since October of 2015, currently supporting us at the detective sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Thank you so much for your support, Jameson. And that will actually be all for today. 
Uh, join us back here tomorrow for The Man Called X, and then uh, we will be back uh, next Tuesday with the next installment of the Airmail Mystery. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash Radio Detectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.